Hello, friends, and welcome to another edition of Turned Out of Punk. I'm your host, Damian Abraham, and once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had their life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, my new buddy, my new pal, you may know him from American football, you may know him from Joan of Arc, you may know him from Cap'n Jazz, you may know him from Owls, you may know him as Owen, Mike Kinsella is on the show today, and this is a fantastic conversation with a legend. More on that in one second, but first, if you'd like to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turnedoutapunkpodcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother, who is this show's producer, and the guest booker extraordinaire, Tristan Abraham, and he will get the message to me. Thank you, Tristan, for all the hard work you do for the show. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Left for Damien. If you'd like to support the show, tell all your friends about it. You can also check out the Turned Out of Punk YouTube page, TikTok page, Facebook page, Instagram page. All those are found at Turned Out of Punk on those platforms. There's videos and other stuff that gets thrown up on those things, so uh, check them out. Uh, I play in a band. We are called Fucked Up. We will be going on tour in July. We've got a lot of cool shows on that including playing with off at one of those final off shows as well as uh oh merch fest on that tour as well you can find out more information over at fucked up.cc i'm not being cagey but we have more stuff to announce soon uh dates and stuff but more on that on future episodes of this podcast as well All right, on to today's show. As I said off the top, we got a legend here, Mike Kinsella, who started playing in bands with Cap and Jazz at age 14 and then has played in some of the most significant bands to kind of come out of the, uh, well, we we talk about this a lot on the show, but I call it punk. I don't know what Mike would have referred to it prior to this, but hopefully now he refers to it as punk as well. Uh, Be it Joan of Arc, be it Owls, be it Owen be it American football or the stuff he records his own. There's, there's a lot, including this brand new, fantastic Owen record, the falls of Sue, which has just come out. You can find it everywhere. Now it is a uh, beautiful listen as is all the stuff. This guy does. This guy is a uh, fantastic songwriter, but we don't just talk about songs on this episode. We talk about uh, lots of stuff. You'll hear it in a second. Why would I spoil it for you? I do get all my SNL dates wrong in this one. The Sugar Cubes did play in 88. Rollins Band didn't play until 97. Faith No More is in 90. Fishbones in 90. Uh, There's some other interesting ones that I'm... R.E.M. prior to that, too. But anyway, uh, my SNL dates that I give in this one are are all over the map. It'll make sense when you get to that part. Well, it won't make sense if you just listen to the dates I'm giving. But that's it. Uh, Don't forget to catch Owen on tour in Europe in the next couple weeks and then doing some American dates all around this brand new record. And that is all from me. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy Mike Kinsella on Turned Out a Punk. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for the interest. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm very excited to get to talk to you because not only are we... uh, fellow ex j tree recording artists but uh i'm a huge fan of all, all your work but i think cap and jazz are a very underrated band and i am very excited to nerd out about that with you and chicago cool. in general yeah awesome i'll try to remember anything well i got to start it off the way they all start off which is mike how'd you get in a punk to remember the first time you ever came across it um you know, I'm I'm sure it was older brother Tim somehow. I don't know the specifics. Um I imagine it was I should start off with I don't I don't know if I'm punk. Uh but uh I think I have enough crossover with punks to be able to keep up. Um Yeah, I guess it would be older brother Tim sort of got me into everything or got into everything first and I just kept, you know, I'd kind of be listening at his door at his bedroom. And then uh some stuff stuck more than others. Um it was probably somewhere, you know, it was some sort of uh, trickle down from like hair metal to real metal to like thrash metal to industrial to punk or something like that. Yeah. 
Chicago had a really good kind of thrash metal underground metal scene, right? Like Master and Abomination and all those. You guys. know what? This is I'm I was in fifth or sixth grade, so I don't know. I didn't get out to many shows yet. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I didn't, like, I didn't uh, see this at all. So either I was into, uh, you know, uh, we would uh, there was like this record store that I would be allowed to walk to with Tim. You know, if Tim and his friends were going, they were older. Um, and we would like rent, what was it called? It was just some, there was just, you know, it was like thrash, whatever, volume four, thrash five. And it, this band violence. I love that band. Um, it was just so, you know, it was, it was more like that California scene. I think I was into like this sort of like skate metal thrash shit. Um, it was also like all this happened within like two years because once I heard like, uh, the cure and the Smiths, I was kind of like, Oh, wait a minute. That's like my vibe. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing time kind of for music at that point with, I guess, the post-punk reverberations and thrash metal all kind of bubbling up as like a young kid. It, I mean, yeah, I guess, too, I didn't know, like, I was into, like, the musicality of it. Like, I was I was trying to figure out cool, you know, the chug guitars and, like, all this stuff. And, like, it was, like, osmosis sort of, like, informing things that I would, like, take with me. It wouldn't be as loud or as, you know, aggressive the way i do it but it's uh it's all stuff that i like appreciated about it i mean i guess what i'm thinking punk though i'm thinking like maybe the opposite of that i'm I'm talking like the metal kind of stuff and then punk was sort of like the dumbed down like oh anybody can pick up a guitar and just do this that was like the allure too to be able to do it in our basement and uh you know and sound just as good as the band's doing it <laughs> like, i think we're better than the misfits like i think we're better <laughs> yeah well i think that's the great thing about uh punk is that and that's why it is like you're saying the inverse of metal in that way is that mm -hmm. you don't have to work on virtuosity at all like some of the mm -hmm. best bands had no virtuosity oh I, I mean it's sort of it's a it actually like uh it almost like made it less credible or less cool i think if you were like good at it if you're good at it then you were like this polished like face-to-face kind of <laughs> You know, I, I like face to face. I like anything. With, you know, I'm a melodic guy, but I don't. You know, I don't. I'm not like, oh, those guys are like, you know, they weren't like the cool part of punk that I was like into, or like, you know, it was kind of like the dirtbag, sort of a uh, anarchist kind of side of it. Yeah. Well, Chicago. Well, like, well, go on. Yeah. Well, it, like also like maybe the horror side of it. Like, I mean, Misfits was a my favorite band. My first favorite band was Kiss. You know, two years old. So like anything like makeup or like fun thing, I was like, oh, that's cool. It's like, yeah. Yeah, I think Misfits are a lot like Kiss, like almost like a He-Man mm -hmm. toy as a mm -hmm. band. Totally. Yeah. I, they could kick Kiss's ass probably. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's still, you know, there, there's definitely like this like cartoon element for sure. Um, and that's attractive to a young mind or yeah. Yeah, I, I find them a fascinating band because they're, simultaneously the greatest punk band ever and not at all a punk band yeah no i mean they, they sound like some sort of 50s pop but dirty and guitar and you know and then the horror element and then yeah it's yeah punk's so weird i guess like i i don't know how to uh i feel like i'm stressing i'm like oh man i don't really know i don't i never i don't know if i'm punk or not um i kind of like i said like sounded like i was just like uh adjacent to my whole life and then uh you know i was driving around in vans at as a teenager and playing all like diy shows and a lot of the bands were playing with the punk bands and stuff and i was like uh you know and i just would stay in the van and peruse a j crew catalog or something i don't know <laughs> or like just play guitar in the band by myself i didn't yeah i don't know well if you're not a punk you certainly changed the genre a lot with the stuff you hmm. did and then yeah. back on it i mean yeah i guess are we calling cap and jazz punk I to me, yeah, Cap, okay. I, I think of Cap and Jazz. Cap and Jazz is to punk what Operation Ivy is to punk, where they are punk bands that uh, cause like a disturbance in the force, <laughs> not in a good way, in a good way, but like spawned these genres that went out from punk and didn't have as much to do with punk rock. But I a hundred percent like Cap and Jazz to me is is definitely a punk band well i, cool. I guess it's up to you how you define it but like you guys were on punk labels you did punk shit like i mean that's what i i guess it's like the the, the ethos is sort of it was definitely diy punk and you know like if you're 
it's under that umbrella for sure. I guess I'm just thinking musically, but you know, it's loud and fast and uh, a little wild, little, you know what I mean? Like unpredictable. So yeah, I mean like all the adjectives work, but. Well, but I think in the, in the same way that I would say that Joan of Arc's a punk band, it doesn't have to be loud and fast and aggressive. Oh, cool. Punk, okay, right? good. Yeah, like, totally. Like, no, Joan of Arc's like the punkest band because it's like unlistenable often. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, like what is happening? I, even being in the band, I remember like getting in fights with Tim where like, he'd be like, okay, here's the song or like the element of what a song is. And then he would, I was playing drums mostly and he'd be like, okay, but like take the beat and just like turn it upside down or like just don't play the one. Don't want, and I'm like, okay, so I'm going to take the beat apart. And it's like, okay, cool. And I'm not going to play the, the original part either. Then. And then, and then by the end, the song isn't even like the song anymore. It's just five people trying not to play the song which is i guess punk i don't know it's cool yeah i remember seeing guys in toronto and it was uh it was over my head at the time like it was was like, that with the promise ring was i don't that? i was hmm. no it was that no it wasn't with promise ring at that show because you guys played the rivoli at a matinee um hmm. okay which is where the kids in the hall kind of got their start oh, cool. stuff. it's like a, a comedy club as well as a venue great venue also fitting yeah so it's also Jonah Brax definitely comedic so but that was punk like it, it's to me like the idea that punk has to be loud and aggressive like i think there has to be an edge to it but i think the the sonic of it is entirely up to the person that puts it out like you cool. look at that stuff coming out of new zealand right like the dunedin scene mm. that's punk as fuck to me mm -hmm. i like it cool then i'll then i'll then i uh, i will do this interview more confidently here we yeah. go yeah yeah don't have complete confidence in being on this show I had Tiffany on this show and I made it work. So I could Whoa. definitely make it work with you, Mike. Is she punk? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay. How'd she get on the show? Because your publicist insisted she was. And mm. I did research and she had uh, records on Cleopatra Records. Okay. And, um, the timing would have lined up that there could have been some weird crossover, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, but, no, no, there was not really. But luckily, she was discovered by uh, Hoyt Atchison, who he's the dad in the movie Gremlins, who brings okay. the Gremlin home. But he also put out these unbelievable kind of like freaked out country psych records. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. You know that song, uh, the, the Pusher? Steppenwolf covers it, if I'm not mistaken. I don't. Was he doing this before or after Gremlins? Did he before, like. Before. Back yeah, in okay. the 60s. So he was just properly. Yeah. Cool. He, he discovered Tiffany. At a, I, yeah. And then he brought her to every mall in America. <laughs> yeah. Her, her, his mom was her manager. So his mom was crazy. The, I think that really kind of, yeah, made that happen. But anyway, this is not about Tiffany. This is about you. And so, <laughs> but rest assured, punk is, is definitely, uh, I think, I think that's the thing about it. Is it something that, like, what is it? But it's something that we all have this relationship to where we don't, Oh, go on sorry well i play um, most of what i or often i play like solo acoustic um i was just saying this i don't remember the context um you know like uh oh i did an interview it was about like guitar stuff <clears throat> and i'm like oh like on paper it was about using alternate tunings and the goal i'm like well i just when i hear like a, an acoustic guitar and standard tuning makes my skin crawl it just sounds like any coffee house even though i know like it's it's what i'm doing isn't that different it just isn't it isn't just a g chord into a d you know what i mean like whatever it is is different enough that it at least allows my brain to do it without being totally embarrassed um but i mean i've, I've played some of the most punk shows i've played have been like just solo acoustic or like you know whatever i'm in a bad mood or the crowd's uh, filled with assholes or whatever and i just like either walk off the stage or i'll just like pick on them and you know with the mic i'm the only guy with the microphone so i'll say some badass and then you know mic drop walk off the stage so okay because you're, you've convinced me i'm so glad of this interview now i am punk absolutely well I, I think that's the thing is like you know, like patrick fitzgerald playing a piano <laughs> back in the day mm -hmm. when punk first happens or um Billy Bragg doing that sort Absolutely. of solo yeah. thing, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I, the punk just opened this door and became this thing that just named something that probably had already, well, definitely already existed. But like, 
you're not doing it in service of a music career necessarily. You're doing it in service of being part of this thing. And yeah. it's like, you know, and it's, for sure. And yeah. And yeah. saying something and uh, maybe changing something, you know what I mean? Like there's like a, yeah, I've never been like political, but I think like it's like obvious where I stand politically just by the way I conduct myself and stuff. So yeah, it's all true. So I guess going way back when, um, I find siblings that are on this show, my, my, like myself included with my, my brother, mm. uh, there's a really interesting relationship with music discovery. Like uh, years ago, Stephen McDonald from Red Cross came on and tells a story that his brother <laughs> judged these two CDs he had bought, brought home as the younger brother. And to this day, every time he goes into a record store, he has to take a shit. Like he gets the nervous <laughs> shits. <laughs> and I, I look back on the way I treated my little brother getting into this music and being really dismissive of his discoveries and things like that. It's, it, there's there's absolutely i mean that's what i was going to say when i was like ah oh, we would like i would drive around and i would play these you know we played house shows and we did everything punk bands do i was just like shy and i just was like total little brother at the time so i was just kind of hiding all the time you know what i mean like i just like it's this is his thing i'm playing the drums but this is you know um that i was gonna bring that up though there's definitely like a little brother thing um yeah i don't think he ever made me well, maybe I don't know. He never like he didn't like shame me. Um, I think he was definitely aware when I was like maybe taking like missteps. <laughs> like that's not cool. What are you doing? Like veering off of the cool path. Uh, you know, I had to learn in my own time. Sometimes I could. I didn't always have him just helping me. So yeah. Well, he, when he was on the show, he brought up these two tape stores that you guys would go to. One mm. being closer. Um, and then one being a little further away that had much more of like a, a kind of punk hub vibe to it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Hip Cat was probably the close one. Wow, what's the other one called? It was like rock and roll something or. I don't think yeah, he said the name. I think he just called it the punk hub. Oh, okay. I mean, one of them was Hip Cat and it was eventually it was like, a, you know, like every Saturday afternoon or whatever. Every weekend it was just like, okay, you get to go with your brother and. I don't know if we got spending money somehow we always bought stuff i don't know where i had any money or whatever but um you know i would i would buy like kiss you know japanese kiss imports like just live in tokyo whatever like this it was a it was properly like a it's a, just like a very cool record store like just totally curated by these like sort of freak dudes one of our friends from high school angel ended up getting a job there so like it continued to be like pretty fucking awesome um and I guess, too, at the time, like, this is, you know, pre-internet and shit. Uh, that's how you found stuff. So if the, the dudes there, whatever they thought was cool, like, if they thought this Japanese Kiss import was cool, then that's what I'm going to get into because my world is only as big as that record shop. Um, so it was, you know, it was all the obvious stuff. And then I guess starting row bands and touring, you kind of like, oh, there's these scenes in every city and they're all, all these indie bands and all these DIY bands are, like, fucking great and you have to like order the records straight from them, you know what I mean? Or maximum rock and roll or whatever it is, however you find this shit. Um, and then like, yeah, I don't know. All the DC scene was like such an inspiration of just like, you can do it yourself. So uh, yeah, once we realize we can just like do this shit ourselves and start our own band or whatever, then uh, I don't think we haven't really looked back. <laughs> We're just kind of like, oh, that's cool. Why don't we just do this, you know? Do you remember the first like local band you remember hearing about that like was you know doing stuff putting out records because you guys are so young. Uh, I mean, I guess by the time we were playing shows, like Screeching Weasel was kind of a big deal, at least in Chicago in our world. I they were from like some like close suburbs and stuff. Um, there was this band. I the first show like sort of punk DIY show I went to I think was Jawbreaker in. It was Green Day or Jawbreaker at like a suburban bar? Um, I, yeah, it was just like, this is awesome. You know, like, again, I was allowed to go because my brother was going and I was in eighth grade or something. Um, and then eventually, I mean, like, by the time I was probably, maybe I was in eighth grade or a freshman in high school, but then like Tim and all his friends were like, uh, they were like booking lungfish shows and like, you know, properly like sort of curating again, like, this chicago suburb scene that was like that was incredible yeah you know going to see like hoover like all these bands that like i'm still kind of like fans of um 
you know, so influential to see like they were kind of like a step older and like, like, hold, that's like the goal. Like, oh my God, like they get to come hang out in Chicago. <laughs> How fun is this? Like you get to go meet people and like, yeah. Yeah, changed my world. It's interesting too, because that point in Chicago, it is like the rise of the uh, Chicago suburban punk scene and all the bands that mm. would kind of come out of that that wind up like when you think about like the biggest bands and the most influential bands uh it, it's a lot of it's chicago stuff like there's so many bands out of that scene that would wind up having impact uh it's but it's that like what you're talking about that mid 90s early 90s i guess but like into the mid 90s mm -hmm. into the late 90s where you've got like chicago's it and it seems like so many of the things are coming out of the suburbs be it like see i don't even know if the bands that i'm like every weekend we would go there's this band eight bark you know that Love band? fucking eight bar. Holy shit. Like, yeah, they uh I just <clears throat> coincided like I didn't I haven't kept up with them. I don't know them. He came to a, uh an Owen show, the solo thing. The bass player, Steve, out of the blue. I'm like, this guy's familiar looking and he's you know 50s or whatever. And I end up like ditching all my friends and sitting in a booth with him and just gushing. I'm like, oh my god, you don't understand like eight bark, like so unique, so cool, like everything that uh it was it Doug Ward? Was he the singer? I think, and he started uh... V Verse. Is it? Yeah, V Reverse v was Reverse, another right. band. Yes, but the label, like that, was like the Cap and Jazz's first song was on like this compilation Underdog. Underdog Records. Yeah, like all that shit. And then he lived in this loft with some friends that just. I guess I'm like I'm going back and I'm seeing it all. It's like up until this point, I was just like. You know, I was on the football team and the basketball team, and just in, I just was a suburban kid or something. But then, like, on some Saturday, I'd like get a ride into the city and see these dudes that live in this loft and they run a record label from their loft. And like, there's a little corner has a recording studio. I'm like, I'm getting a fucking four track. Like, I want you know, I'm doing this all wrong. Like, I want to, I want to make music. It's so fun. So that yeah. that underdog records uh, scene is 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 awesome and like what you're talking about that loft thing that's come up on the show a lot that there were like collective meetings mm -hmm. that people would go to then and it really does seem like yeah you know, like a real source of inspiration for like a whole day yeah it's uh every so often we would like i remember always being jealous like touring in europe <clears throat> you know there's like some uh autonomous zone properly like you're like your show is in some like anarchy abandoned government sponsored somehow but like you know i'm just like why do these places don't exist in chicago but or like in the states even um you know and like before the show like some guy's gonna show you how to like i don't know like fix your bike you know like fix your bike tire i just remember just like being young and being like this is so cool like this is like or like how to uh you know how to survive in a van for a week and sh there's like these little like punk seminars happening and everybody's sort of like bringing like potluck like it's just like this community thing that uh i guess it's the underground loft is kind of like in my mind like that you know what i mean it's just like a, it's not a big thing but it's like this group of people that are like like-minded and uh sort of like in my mind socially responsible and like helping others <laughs> like in a way like that's how i feel like the scene always was it was sort of like you know like oh you can yeah sure you can be like the seventh band on this bill because you need gas money no problem you know what i mean we will raise 60 bucks for your band or something. And then everybody helped everybody. And yeah, it really does feel like the nineties was the closest that ever came to happening in, I guess, North American, broadly speaking, because I'm throwing Canada mm -hmm. in there too, but like hardcore and punk where you would have like mm -hmm. food, not bombs. You'd have mm -hmm. AK press tables at the backs of shows. You totally. Would, you know, yeah. Like, yeah. It, it did feel like, because it was, <laughs> and this is like, once again, the like coming back to this thing, punk and the power of this thing is that, it wasn't in service of anything but this scene. So you weren't like, there was no like, okay, how do we make money off this? What's the merch cut for the venue? Not at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there was no, I mean, there was no, it was a, there was no way to make money. You know what I mean? Like, even like, yeah, like the dudes in the back of the show selling their like imported records that they, you know, like, I mean, imported, like they just sort of mail cataloged the, the again, like the, the, there were 30 records they thought were cool and like that's the only chance you can find it you know in your town so you bought it um yeah it wasn't it was i mean i don't know what happened i guess uh <laughs> my mind went straight to j tree okay well like you know like some of those bands that this is from just my experiences like some bands on j tree or some got popular and then they got they tried to go to a major and then 
that just like infiltrated everything. We're like, oh, all these bands were getting signed to majors. And then the whole, uh, I guess the whole point was that you weren't going to like make money doing it. You just wanted to do it. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, what if you're offered money or something? And then people wanted the money. I don't know. I mean, the punk shit still happening. I just, you know, I just got old. And... Yeah. Well, and, and that's why it's so awesome because like we can't hold on to the zeitgeist of it forever. And mm -hmm you pass it off to another generation and they're not going to sell out ever in the same way we were never going to sell out ever. And, yeah. and they will carry, carry it to a new place and it'll have power for them. And, you know, I'm not saying you have to like age out and, and not be into it anymore, but like, yeah, you know, it's just not yours in the way yeah. it once was. And it, right. And it shouldn't be. I mean, yeah. that's the whole point. Like it is, it's definitely like a, it's definitely like a youthful. Uh, I mean, I'm saying this as we're like, embarking on these captain jazz reunion shows and i'm like i gotta join the gym like i'm <laughs> i am not fit enough to even you know yeah plus i need to get paid if i'm gonna do it i'm just kidding but i think it's kidding. well i think it's also because like these brief brief moments in time that are documented on these records or in you know shitty vhs tapes uh are become so important to a culture that you know going back to them and letting people experience uh those songs live and i think that's like a real natural part of this thing and i don't think it's counter to the whole process. no i i think it's amazing i mean i i mean i uh i saw the best live show i've seen in like since i saw the cure probably you know seven years ago the best live show i've seen since is the cure <laughs> like this summer this past summer i'm like they're still the best like it's you know it's not like they're milking it or something they're just like we wrote these fucking songs and people want to see them and it's the best you know yeah. and i would say that dinosaur jr's post reunion <laughs> output is is up there it, oh like, yeah with the first wave of stuff like my nostalgia obviously for the first wave of stuff is stronger mm -hmm. but yeah like i i i love those new records yeah it's like totally it's 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 like it's it's, he's totally true to like this is what's coming out and it's 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 right on yeah no they're great also the productions the same you know what i mean like this it's not like he's trying yeah huge fan yeah, yeah. they were they were i think one of the first bands to not first bands but like one of the first wave of people to age out of hardcore but like hmm. not leave it and not want to like turn your back on it and like find like a new you know like be like oh now i'm in a dance band type move that mm -hmm. some people did right like it's but they were like i think the the roadmap for like okay what do you do when you don't necessarily identify with the kids that are now in charge of the scene mm -hmm. yeah i i mean they're, they're definitely like elder statesmen on all these ways of like i mean i like loved i think green mind was like i guess i was in like eighth grade and it was like the only record i listened to and then like a few years later they were headlining whatever Lollapalooza it was. And I went and I was like, so like, fuck this. Like, it was a terrible way to see. I've seen them, uh, you know, in clubs and whatever for a couple of years. And then I was so annoyed that they were like, I have to now see them on the lawn at this giant festival because I was young and punk or whatever. <laughs> We've established I was punk. Um, yes. But then, I mean, they, I get, yeah, like fast forward and it's like, oh, cool. They still just want to keep putting out good records. You know what I mean? Great. I'm going to see them every fucking time. Like, it's the best. So. Yeah, I, you can do it. I kind of also now love the bad shows I saw bands play. I saw like uh, Bad Religion one time play at like four in the afternoon as the sun is like blinding everyone on stage. And like it was probably not a great performance for them. But the idea that that was such a unique time seeing them out of all the times I've seen them is something mm -hmm. that I kind of like hold on to. So like seeing an band in an awkward space or opening for someone and how they're just trying to manage that. I think that's like, uh, I don't know, it's like maybe I just like the art of failure and being well, in a band. Now I appreciate failing on and having to be in those awkward situations where maybe it's not working. Or like the triumph of like, you know what? We just did our job. We, we did it. <laughs> like yeah. it was like the, no one's the wiser how much the band is hating it. You know, that's the goal. It's like, yeah. Uh, American football played a stupid big festival. Um, I guess it was this past summer. And you know, if if anybody, if like if there's a video of it, 
it's just going to be all of us looking for a monitor guy the whole time. Like 35 minutes of us just looking for a monitor guy. And, okay, thank you very much. And we exit the stage. Like that was it. That's all I remember from the whole show. So, um, you know, somebody out there could be like, it sounded great. I'd be like, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't even know what it sounded like. Yeah. yeah. And even if it didn't sound great, like I think that is like, like like in a Grateful Dead bootleg style, like that is a memorable show that you know if we were right. tape traded like that. It's like, one part of the whole thing, exactly. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. I think that probably comes with getting older too, right? Like where you can finally like enjoy the failures as much as the successes. Totally. I mean, it goes to like <clears throat> picking up my kids at school, and I'll be like, "Oh, I just said like seven dumb things to the other moms or whatever." You know what I mean? But I'm like, "Well, well, like fucking Larry David style. Like, what am I gonna do? You know, I'm a little weird, I guess. I don't know." Yeah. Um, whereas when the kids were little, and you know, I'd be like, "It would ruin my day." Yeah. I'd be like, "Oh man, like, I, I'm, it's so you know, all the other moms think I'm a dork or whatever, and now I'm." The kids are going to get made fun of because their dad's weird. Like, but now I don't really take it with me as much. So, I, I had yeah. real fear of being the weird dad because I had the weird dad as a kid. Yeah, uh, do you have kids? And I have kids. I got three kids, okay. and uh, I definitely am the weird dad. But luckily, we're at an alternative school, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of weird dads and moms so and parents and. You're the coolest dad. The weird, yeah. Well, there's uh, definitely there's definitely some really cool parents there, so I can't even claim that. But at least I'm not the strangest. Like when I show up to pick up the kids in sweatpants, no one's like, "What's going on with this guy?" I just got back from a, my son at like a wax museum. He was dressed like Zeus, whatever. <clears throat> and another dad. It was me standing in a group of dads. <laughs> I'm laughing because it just happened 20 minutes ago. And the one guy's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm working from home. You know, they're like, what's up, you know, with your sweatpants or something? He's like, oh, I'm working from home. And I'm like, you know how hard it was for me to put on pants to come here? Like, I work from home every day, motherfucker. Like, yeah. And I'm just like, oh, this is, they must think. Uh, the first day, uh, my daughter started first grade, like, in whatever. And she ended up being in this track where it was first grade through eighth grade, the same same classroom. So oh, wow. this is the first day of first grade, the first time I'm meeting all these parents. And I happen to have to go right to a funeral after that. So I was wearing a suit, you know, everybody's like, oh, hi, that's mine. You know, they're all adorable, the best. And then like every day after that, I would just show up in like a swimsuit, <laughs> like because I have nothing to do all day and I just wear swimsuits around. And I always laugh like the first they must be like whoa what the fuck did he get fired after the first day of you know like his one day of work or something it's like and went then, way downhill yeah wow like this yeah i really like tried to, or they think i really tried to impress them that first day yeah when the truth is i just had to go to a funeral yeah, yeah it's way sadder way sadder than yeah that. it's yeah in all kinds of ways way sadder yeah yeah it's um <laughs> it, it is it's weird like the idea of being like a middle class band and i i say this like in the sense that like a band where you can make a living from mm -hmm. this thing never enough that you can be like i know off. exactly what you mean yeah i yeah. mean it's a it's like a it's a great it's like the best part-time-ish job you know what i mean yeah, yeah totally yeah and even but you kind of i couldn't do it full-time because you know what i mean like it's like almost like there's definitely a ceiling. How popular you are doesn't depend on what, you know, I guess I can play more shows, but there would be diminishing results. There's not a great demand for more shows. And I have these kids I got to be home for. I mean, yeah, I know what you mean. It's sort of yeah. like, yeah, no, it's like, it's all my, my bands are like way more successful than I ever thought they'd be. And still just the middle class. Like it's still, <laughs> there's no aspiration of like getting to some other level or something. You know what I mean? I don't know what that is even. I don't know. I think I'm limited in what I can do. I don't think you are, though. Like, I think if you chased it in the way that, like, probably it'd be kind of gross, to be honest. Like, I, there I would be for you, I that's imagine. What, oh, that's what I have no desire to. That's what I mean. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm just totally, I love, like, uh, being able, I, I love being able to set up shows whenever I want. That's mm -hmm. the goal. Like, oh, I want to go on tour next fall. Cool. You know, it's a week or two. It's perfect. By the time I'm home, I, I'm happy to be home. Yeah. How often do you guys play out? Less and less these days, it seems, but we do probably about cumulatively two months of shows a year. Oh, that's a, that's a lot. It's a lot. I it's mean, like, it, it, but that's spread out kids, or whatever. Yeah. You know, and like now I we have a festival offer and it's on my youngest child's birthday. 
Yeah. They're their eight. It's yeah. a real birthday to them. That's a real birthday. So I got yeah. to, I got right. to be here for them. Like I tried to bring it up to them and I was like, are you okay, bud? If dad's away for your birthday. And mm. they got very angry at me. Yeah. Can you do like the party? We three would. days before. I don't know. I yeah, don't, exactly. Yeah. We would. But I think for them, it's like, how do you explain that? Especially because at the same time, it's not like the band's paying for trips to Disney World or anything. So it's not like I can feel like. Right. You can right, translate we're, it. Yeah. We're going to go yeah. and see like Universal Studios, though, with the money we make. It's like, no, yeah, we yeah. kind of need the money to pay the bills. So. Yeah. We're getting by. Yeah. yeah getting I mean, by. that's, you know, it's a hard lesson. Maybe it it sucks. I have like a standing, I won't be gone on Halloween. I just think like that's like my one of my daughters in high school and the other boys in sixth grade. So a little ahead of eight, but maybe where your other ones are at. Um, Halloween still seems like the one like I'm like, I don't want to miss this. Like everybody's fucking dressed up. It's fun. Candy. Like that's like an actual fun one. Thanksgiving. I'm out of here. I mean, also divorce life. I'm kind of like. It's too weird anyways. You know, nobody, the kids don't want to go back and forth. Like, I'm just like, I'm just going to be gone on Thanksgiving. So, yeah. Uh, Halloween for me, we've missed a couple and it hurts me so mm -hmm. much. And like yeah. last Halloween, we're playing in New York City with the damned on Halloween, right? Like, so I should be happy. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's right. But it's like, you know what it's like? It's like, you're, yeah. I would trade, I would trade, you know, the damned, the cure, and Susie all playing in New York City to hang out with the kids on Halloween. And but yeah. there's other other people depending on you for Yeah, I don't know. No, it's totally it's a it is a weird uh this is I like that this is where the punk conversation went to. <laughs> like adult punk shit, right? Yeah. Like I get all of it. Also, like you playing that show is like that's a dream, man. You know what I mean? Like you're like, holy cow, this is so fun on Halloween. Like at any point of your life, you'd be like, This is the fucking goal. Like we've made it. We're having this is the best. Except my kids are all dressed up and they're running around. And yeah, so it's a weird, uh, it's definitely like a, it's just with, you know, multiple uh, kids. And if everybody's got multiple kids and everybody's got different schedule and have different priorities, it's, yeah. It's different. It's, it becomes, and I think it's the idea of like, you know, you should never expect to make money out of this thing, but at the same time, it is part of your life. And it's something that. Well, to your point too, like, this this thing is offered to you like this festival on the birthday it's like you got to pay your bills well this is when it's offered this, yeah. is, this is the job i mean i don't know about what your day-to-day -day is like but my argument is i'm like well you know 30 20 27 days a month i'm making you breakfast i'm making you lunches i'm home when you get home from school. you know what i mean like mm -hmm. so a lot of the other dads are sort of like they don't get home till 7 p.m anyways so you know they're missing all this stuff so it know. is. It's a trade off. It's like the, and I'm like, and it sounds like I'm always weary about having these kinds of conversations because I think if you're not, if it's not like your reality, it's going to sound mm -hmm. like, oh my God, listen to these guys fucking complaining about this shit. I mean, if you, whatever you want to cut after this, go ahead and cut. Yeah. <laughs> but I, but I do, but I, I think it's an important conversation to have because there's like, it's funny. I talked to someone the other day who was on the podcast, a fellow J Tree. Uh, hmm. former J True recording artist too, Andy uh, Nelson. And oh, he yeah. Was, and he was talking about how he didn't think, you know, bands shouldn't expect to make money off punk. And and I, I think that's like a very a noble thing, but the guys who run the labels and the guys who put on the shows and the people that make the t-shirts and the people, like there's a they're lot making of making money, yeah. They're making money off this thing. It's like a, a living for them. And, and certainly hmm. like like you're saying, it, it changes the way you approach the thing when you're chasing the money. Mm -hmm. But it's just, I don't know, these are the things I wrestle with and I'm not articulating it very well at all to you right now. But uh, You are, you don't even have to, I mean, I don't know if there's, if there's, you know, there, I imagine some sort of audience, they might need more clarification. I'm, it's, I totally, I don't, you know, this are, this is like half of our band practice is sort of like, you know, like what are, what are, what what do we all want? It's all different, you know, yeah. and that's only in one band. I'm in a couple bands and there's different people in different stages of life. Um, the middle class thing is so funny. It's a funny way to put it because there's definitely, uh, I think people listening that would maybe know your bands and my bands would like, I don't know, like maybe they just think because they know our music or our bands that we're like rich or famous or something. Yeah. Yeah. But we're not at all like in life. And then 
conversely, uh, you know, like the other dads at pickup are baffled that I get by, you know what I mean? I'm like, well, I get by, it's fine. You know, like there's just like this whole other, like if, you know, we're not fallout boy, but we're not playing Starbucks. You know what I mean? Like there's something in between that we've gotten by and, and it is, you know, it, you know, you could be punk and get by. I don't think you have to apologize for like, you know, I think it, I think it can all happen, especially now. I mean, I don't know about, I'm just, I'm blown away. Like Fagazi won't play a show, <laughs> like donate all the money to charity. Just play the show, man. Just, you know, people want it. Like we were saying earlier, like people want to hear the old songs. They want to hear whatever. So in, in like, uh, like not on this show, but like in, in conversations, he hates when I say this, but they they can't do it now. Like that's why I don't think yeah. they do it because like, like look at, look at Pearl Jam's struggle to find a, a non like was it Clear Channel back then or Ticketmaster they were mm-hmm. going against Clear, or or like Connor Oberst versus Clear Channel when he was mm-hmm. fighting that fight it these things are impo- insurmountable kind of like challenges for the scale they would have to come back at like I guess you could have an army of volunteers to do it and and things like that um, yeah but. I don't know. I think the amount of money that it would, you know, they're not going to be playing Coachella and right. They should have their, well, whatever. <laughs> I it, would be, that. it would be, it would be interesting to see. I don't know. Like, I think that is the ultimate one. Right. And that's the one that kind of like, when you think about pre Nirvana, like who were the bands that were making mm-hmm. a living doing this thing? It was few and far between, right? Like, so dinosaur junior Sonic youth, Mm-hmm. Uh, Bugazi, Bugazi, replacements, uh, Husker Du, probably, um, REM, obviously, on the higher end, yeah. But even REM, I was already th- these bands, a lot of them had like major label, but like major label is different, you know. They're just, I mean, like they were still right. I mean, before yeah. Nirvana, you know, like before, like, I mean, the, even just like major label, like they all had subsidiaries after Nirvana and they all like, well, you're on this little branch of this major and you're getting the major money, but it, you're, we don't care about you and whatever. Yeah. Um, I guess Faith yeah. No More too, probably like a little bit later, also on a major by that point just before. They were definitely on a major. I mean, like I liked them. I mean, I had to like know about them somehow and it wasn't, uh, you know, like some local label or something or yeah. Um, they played on SNL in 88. Which I find crazy. Faith no more. Yeah, and sugar cubes. Sugar cubes makes a little sense. Well, I guess I don't know, but it also doesn't because I don't know. Yeah, like how popular could that music have been? But I don't know. <laughs> That's what I think too. Like Rollins band def- played on there too. Yeah, like there's well, some weird years. Rollins band was after Nirvana, wasn't it? Well, I think this is like before, right? Like I don't know. I haven't actually ever looked up the performance. Um, uh, I've been doing a nerdy deep dive into the, like the punk history of SNL and it's mm. one of the things that's kind of come up, but yeah. Um, do you, would, uh, is there, there's definitely, I mean, like, is there anything cool or punk about their music choices in the past 15, 20 years or something? Or is it just sort of like popular bullshit? A lot of it, like it's, there's definitely stuff. It's like interesting to see how the relationship to punk with that thing changes and kind of follows punk's trajectory where like, like blink Way twos on there a lot. Uh, the, the Foo Fighters, who are arguably the the greatest collection of hardcore musicians, not playing hardcore mm-hmm. out yeah, there. Hardcore asterisk, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, so there are like things like you point out, and, and Phoebe Bridgers on there as well. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's definitely. But they they had a really thorny relationship with punk, right? Like even like uh, Elvis Costello changing the song halfway through, oh, and then they like banned him or some yeah, 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 fear causing the riot replacements getting drunk like it was was replacements banned like did they only give that one performance yeah yeah they got harry dean stanton uh fucked up and, oh uh, right 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 i can picture like yeah the <laughs> meme of him fucked up um him fucked up doesn't look that different than him not fucked up um i'm trying to think of uh well that shit's live i mean like they're you know they're beholden to like these standards that Oh shit, that just went out loud. Like, you know what I mean? I don't know. It's different, you know. At yeah. least they tried to have these punk things. I feel like there was like, it seemed like at some point, even just SNL in general was like this, like, uh, you know, whatever the punk version of like a comedy thing would be. But 
you know, early yeah. on. But yeah, well, and then like John Belushi played in the Dead Boys. Oh, okay. There you go. Like <laughs> one show. It's an actual, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's like um and then actually, well, speaking of which, like uh, Fred Armisen, did you ever see Trenchmouth? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's what, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, I mean, these bands were like, a trench mouth is another band with like eight bark and stuff, but like, they're just like grandfathers of like what I thought. I'm like, this is the coolest shit ever. And I, these bands, like, you know, they're playing uh, the Fireside Bowl or something, and like the whole place is losing their mind, but I don't know how they did on tour. I don't know if they had, they never had tour support or like, I don't know if they sold any records or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, Fred was amazing. It feels like Chicago had like a real, um, like bands could be super popular in Chicago, but that popularity might not translate outside. Of... You know, like uh, Naked Ray Gun? Yes, exactly. Or, yeah, they were, I mean, like everybody, if you're, you know, everybody had to love them, but I don't know how they did. I mean, I knew they were, they must have done all right. They were like a real band, but uh, yeah, in Chicago, that's like, they were like, green day now you know just like oh fuck like yeah make it ring everybody <laughs> yeah i love i love them and I, and they definitely are you know revered around the world but my gauge for it was always the fact that when you went to chicago chicago bands records were always more expensive than they would be outside of the city that's hilarious i mean yeah i remember <laughs> i remember my naked ray gun seven inch i bought for i forget how much but then i went to chicago and it was like double the price I they're going. selling fast i don't know yeah but it feels like there was this sort of like real insular kind of kind of scene where like even if the bands got out there, it might not be they might not connect in the same way they did locally. Yes, I don't know. I mean, I think so. I I'm like really proud of like uh, just whoever was influencing me. Um, I always thought like New York was like. Everybody's trying to be super cool right musicians or whatever like there's always like a a character uh and then la everybody's trying to be famous so there's also this character but new york or chicago is just like working class musicians just like you know i yeah i just yeah like even i'm saying like even as like as i look getting a little older like all like like the influence tortoise had of just like oh my god like they sort of flipped like this is like like they were they were such a fun cool live show like two percussionists all the bells all the stuff um and then everybody's like well i don't need to just you know play loud or play angular and stuff i can make it like jazzy like that's a cool like indie cool new thing um i just yeah i'm just like remembering like all the ways chicago like the city has influenced me um yeah those were like different steps for sure well it's like it's wild cuz it, like you're saying in a few years these this sort of like new scene mixes with the city scene and you have like so much stuff like from the victory record stuff to the mm -hmm. touch and go stuff to the i guess more am rep stuff which i guess crosses over a little bit mm -hmm. but like there's just like to the pop punk screeching weasel stuff and then like the sort of like birth of what i guess gets labeled midwestern emo is also kind of popping off at the same time too mm -hmm. um which is interesting because like I, I don't know, I like I imagine that's like a fairly fraught term to have to be saddled with given what gets labeled emo these days. I don't ever think about it. Like if this podcast <laughs> was turned out emo, I'd be like, ah, I don't think I'll pass. Yeah, like I don't you know, I don't I just don't think about it. I'm way more concerned if I said dumb shit to my kids friends' parents. Um every I'm I'd say it like uh, you know, whatever i'm doing that is called emo or something I'm just like man i only listen to this missing care like all that shit was just like hard on your sleeve like dramatic whatever i'm like that was so that's where that's coming from uh i don't know like, yeah because like you know i talked to andy and i was talking to dan as well and like i think he's got the same sort of thing with lifetime where like he he was in a punk band and he was just playing this kind of music and this was the music that came out mm -hmm. And doesn't really feel a lot of relationship or kinship even with a lot of the people that were into what he was into uh, mm -hmm. or like was it or that were into the band i should say they were into lifetime in the post lifetime world so yeah it's like it's but i find so it, what wait 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 what, what what world would that be though that he's not i like he doesn't i don't want to 
name names for him, but <laughs> I threw out a, a, a series of names and he said, well, I don't really feel a lot of relationship with the, all those bands. And it was like Fall yeah. Out Boy, um, oh, yeah. uh, uh, New Found Glory, and Save I, the all, Day. Those bands would have loved Lifetime. Yes. But I, I absolutely could see it doesn't, it's not a two way street. I mean, it's because, I mean, Lifetime was just like totally fucking punk, but like melodic in these ways that these other bands are like, they took like the melody and they kind of just like ironed it out and it was like palatable. You know, it's still loud, it's still like whatever, but it's like more fun or something. And Lifetime, Lifetime, you know, they just, they blended like hardcore in a way that these other bands either didn't want to or couldn't execute as well <laughs> well there's something get, yeah look well, that when you know new jersey's best dancers came out it was like this moment where all these hardcore bands were like pop punk that's the ticket <laughs> like mm-hmm. it was and that uh, and it would happen here in toronto there were definitely tons of bands that kind of mm-hmm. came out of that wake but i find that also that's what i love about this music too is that there's certain records that come out and it's like everything changes and mm-hmm. And the reaction might not necessarily be positive to it. Like there might be a whole wave of people that are like, you know, fuck this. Like I always bring up uh, Jamie Josta in Victory Magazine saying that he formed Hatebreed because someone told him Quicksand was a hardcore band. And he was like so pissed that that was what hardcore was <laughs> at that point. Walter doesn't seem as stoked about it when I tell him, but I'm like, that's amazing that you can inspire with both swings of the sword. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's like negative. Uh that's hilarious. I mean, also, like, that cracks me up, like, that he, like, took such offense that he's like, I'm going to, I got to change this or something. Um, I'm laughing about uh, sort of full circle. I remember playing a Jade Tree, uh, what is like a CMJ Jade Tree show. You know, imagine, like, like, Joan of Arc had to play with Lifetime. And I'm just like, well, this is a weird bill, man. Like, whatever. <laughs> it's so funny. I was, like, always a fan. Again, probably not a two way street is my how I took it. Uh, well, I, I bet you they loved you guys. I, I would. I'm I, I, we didn't. We didn't get that a lot of. We didn't get that vibe. I'm saying. I think personalities. They, I mean, everybody's really nice, and whoever I don't really know them. Um, but I think it was like kind of like I think we were, you know, we were like the odd uncle at the party or something. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> but I think that's the thing is like as. I think the 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 logical quote unquote thing in the careerist impressing the dads at school kind of vibe would be at the end of Cap and Jazz for the for Joan of Arc to be more accessible and become like where everything else seemed to go with that sort of like yeah um, yeah yeah sound, but mm-hmm. you guys went the opposite way. <laughs> it made something yeah. that way more challenging and I mean that's all way Tim. more punk. That's all Tim. No, Tim is. I mean, you know, it's. <laughs> I'm not, I won't take any credit. I, you know, I was, uh, I guess, you know, like I was kind of, I, I wrote a lot of those same songs and stuff, but you know, the deconstruct deconstruction element was all Tim just being like, no, nah, I don't, I don't think we should play loud. I don't think we should do like what Captain Jazz said. We already did it. And I'm like, that's cool. It is cool. Um, having gotten back in a room and playing these Captain Jazz songs, I was like, oh man, it would have been fun. And we would have only just gotten better at it. Like, <laughs> like uh, I think, yeah. Anyway, Cap- Captain Jazz is like the Green River of emo, where like the band <laughs> breaks up. Uh, Davey That's... goes on to the the Pearl Jam side of things, mm-hmm. and you guys go on to the Mud Honey side of things. I wish I was in Mud Honey. That well, kind of cool. are right. Like, you know, I'm sure Mud Honey. You know, like they like Mr. Up in the calculations, like that. I, I see a sonic kinship between uh, Joan of Arc and that band. Have you heard that stuff? I don't know. No, I don't it, know. It was Mark Arms pre uh, Green River oh. band. That's just like oh. super out there weirdo mm-hmm. punk, I guess, for yeah, lack of a descriptor. It's just like the catch all for something that doesn't fit into like, uh, yeah, because I think that's a, well, and that's a, it, and I think it's, it's hardcore where it really starts. Um, starts getting like codified in this kind of like real way Mm -hmm. Um, and it's easy to market and that i guess that's ultimately why all these things become part of like popular lexicon is because it's make something sellable but prior to that like it could be it could be like the screamers and it could be the go-go's and it could be the germs Mm -hmm. and it could be black flag it could be anything Mm -hmm. 
and and everything. O- that Octung Chicago comp. You know, like you go through that. Every band sounds different there, but you guys are all just like united by the fact that you're like, you want to make music. And like you said, like where ge- geography affects music hugely. Like, I think that's why Toronto never really had a big 80s hardcore scene is because Toronto's kind of an industry town. So there was always that path mm. to success in metal or new wave where mm-hmm. some places where there wasn't that path the music develops differently yeah you know i mean like new york and la where like you could just your whole you know again it's like a maybe there's like some acting element or performing element that the chicago bands didn't have you know what i mean like there was nobody in a trench mob but damon is like a real he's a great front man like he was like a proper front man like um you know, a lot of the other bands are just working class dudes just trying to like, play the song. You know, that's like, that was the vibe kind of. Uh, I guess Steve Albini was a uh, transplant to Chicago, but he was a good, he's a great front man. He's got like a energy. Um, and Damon's a transplant too, right? He's I think he's from DC originally. So that could explain that. Oh yeah, maybe he was. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Again, like it's like the, just the next generation, but uh that would explain it actually. It's yeah. got like that DC kind of that's a different like yeah. It's a different kind of energy. Um I find the DC thing especially like it is it's something that looms so large in punk especially at that time where like be it Fugazi or a little bit later on with you know the Riot Girl stuff or the Nation of Ulysses stuff before that kind of coming out of there like you've got like a a real influence on stuff that's happening. Oh, it was, I mean, huge. That was that was sort of like the scene that uh, uh, I feel like whatever, like our Midwest collective happening, um, all of us were just huge fans of what was happening there. It was just a trickle down of uh, any any anything on Discord. And it's like the it was so varied too that like we just everybody, you know, it was like, oh, my God, you hear this new Discord band, Shutter, thank you, hear this new band, Jawbox, blew our minds and uh, yeah. And they also like all these bands were got like so good, like technically so good that it was the perfect uh, for me at that age. Like, oh shit, like what's happening here? Like, I mean, Shudder to Think was huge of just like, what the fuck is that beat? So I'm, you know, learning how to play drums at that time. So I'm like trying to learn while learning that, you know, up until that point, I'm just listening to like Lars Ulrich fucking just hit everything on the everything at the same time on all the things. Anyways, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it is. It is like the, uh, I don't know, the impact. But like you were saying earlier about the the influence of these record stores, like you find out that like that Empire record showing up at Yesterday and Today becoming the huge influence on all those bands to have that sound, and that's where mm-hmm. they were kind of discovering it from too. And it's just sort of this like, it's interesting how it gets passed around and the influence and, and seeing where that influence is taken. I think mm-hmm. with Cap and Jazz, the thing that I've always been struck by is that there's like a television personalities or a um, uh, like UK DIY kind of feel to it too, where there's huh. like a, you know, like a playfulness. That's yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's like the useful shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't think, I don't think that and I think none of that would come out right now. I mean, just from having band practices a couple weeks ago, like I wouldn't play these beats. I actually said, I'm like, should I like, try to play the beats as they are or should I try to play them as I'd play them as a grown man who like put some thought into them and wasn't just trying to hit them. like any and they're like just play them as they are like just play the things that yeah so you know like I wouldn't have hit a crash cymbal on every one three five seven nine. Yeah, I'm, just like, I'm just like hitting everything I'm like what a fucking idiot yeah like so uh there's something about it captured a moment when that's what happened so you know yeah, and that's what I, I think keeps. Is, well, that's what makes it more in line with like K Records than oh Discord sure Discord Records. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, no. There's like a there's a. I always thought what's I don't even know. Uh, her name, the drummer of Unwound, uh, during Cap and Jazz was a huge influence on me. Of just kind of like that like just like random like errant crash symbols. I'm like that's I used to love that. I was yeah. It was like a this like it was just a weird tech sloppiness <laughs> like it just sounded like yeah i was a big fan of that i was so, i was talking I'm, to Mo- i was talking to molly newman from bratmobile mm-hmm. the other day and we we're talking about drumming and just like there's such like a uh like a oh this is like the good drumming and to be a good drummer you got to sound like 
Keith Moon or John Bonham, mm. and that's good drumming. But like, there's so many cool different styles in punk. And going back to like mm. proto punk stuff too, like where like people are just playing this completely differently, and and the drums can serve a different purpose in a band than yeah. they do in a lot of rock and roll. Totally. Uh, we're you know like when we make these like American football demos, when I'm writing a guitar part, I I hear the drums, and so I'll demo out what I'm hearing, and then. The drummer Steve is always like, "Can you send me a version without the drums? You know, the demo drums." And he sends back some totally different. Like it'll be a different one. It'll be a different everything. Just totally, totally different. It's like two different languages of the same instrument. And then uh, know, there's another drummer in the band, Nate, who like tries to finesse everything because I'll be like, "I don't even know what Steve just sent me." <laughs> and I'll be like, "Like no, no, he's here and he's here like a nine. Like he's like he's like translating between us." Um, yeah, it's totally, I mean, yeah, like it's, you don't, uh, my favorite drummer of all time is probably Alex Van Halen. Mm. And I think he's fucking incredible and like a total unicorn. Like uh, the production on his drums are also like so weird that I, I, I could see why people don't like it. It's like totally, anyways, um, I don't know if he's a good drummer. Like, I don't know if he can play to a click track. It doesn't seem like it. I made a tweet probably a decade ago it's like my best tweet ever it's like it sounds like alex van halen never heard any of the songs until he had to track them just like okay play along to this and just like oh fuck like just gonna keep up and it's i, I love that sound like it's so cool it's also so cool that they were like the biggest band in the world and that's they're just like that sounds cool good enough you know what i mean like it's yeah it's not like tight it's not like it doesn't seem super planned out you know it just seems sort of like seems like raw in a way that it's attractive well it's like i guess like that's what gives a lot of the personality to these bands totally that's why that band is unique right right, right. that's mm -hmm. why everything now is sort of like you know quantized and i mean i am aware of the bands i'm in i know which bands of mine are quantized <laughs> whatever <laughs> i just i also appreciate like when it's not that way i'm like oh fuck that must be cool well and that, i think there's space for everything like that too like there's there's sure. space for bomber from rkl strumming style and there's space for mo tucker's drumming style and mm -hmm. um maybe not most politics as much but like definitely the drumming style of the politics these days we're talking drums yeah we're only <laughs> we're talking, talking about drums. Drum. we're only talking the drumming on this thing uh what's what are some of your memories in terms of like the violence at shows like was there violence at the shows by the time you were going because i I've, I've definitely heard chicago has had periods of pretty heavy shit going down at shows uh either i missed it i'm too young or i'm too old no i mean no we you know we didn't weren't playing like uh i there was are you, i guess i'm thinking maybe in the 80s there was like like naked ray gun shows there was probably some like skinhead type of punk element that was probably uh a thing to like deal with uh like some fucking dorks in the suburbs that are so bored that yeah. they have to whatever anyways uh yeah I, that wasn't really a thing it was all just fucking love it was so yeah i mean like cap and jazz days like all of our sort of diy shit was like so like anywhere we went it was just like people it's like oh this is unbelievable like you got 50 people in this basement and uh you made us dinner and we get to also sleep on your floor. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So it was all just kind of like positive, I think. How much you asked you asked about violence, right? Yeah, it was about violence <laughs> the, of the shows. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I mean we, we there was never I guess the playful thing you're talking about too with Cap and Jess, like there was never uh it wasn't even there was no like it was def definitely like anti sort of like East Coast hardcore tough guy shit. Like there was no there wasn't like that sporty jockey mix of like, yeah, it was just all, you know, it was all goof kind of like goofy punk or something. I don't know. Well, not that these guys were necessarily, you know, violent assholes or anything, but like, there's also like the Billingsgate, only the strong mm. bloodthirst, like this whole other sort of like hardcore scene, like that's, East that's Coast less, leaning. Yeah. Less asshole, but definitely there's like a jockey kind of like tough guy. Right. I mean, yeah, that's my it's take different. of it is sort of a, uh, yeah, it wasn't like, you know, like we didn't start to sit. Tim wasn't like, here we go. Like, <laughs> you know, get ready for, you know, it was just sort of like, I don't know, is everybody ready? We're in tune. I'm just going to, and then, yeah. 
<laughs> it was so, it was more chaos than like you know like some controlled aggression or something yeah so what bands did you guys play with like was it gauge and and that sort of if when we yeah gauge played every weekend so either we played every other weekend with them and then went and saw them every other weekend we didn't play um yeah gauge was like total big brothers for all of us um and like way more proficient on their instruments than we were so they were always like an inspiration um friction was a yeah. band i loved which is bob from when it to be braid um they, they formed right after you guys right like shortly thereafter friction might have yeah maybe they might have been going on kind of with us maybe and then i feel like they were kind of early-ish i mean like yeah they were releasing stuff um their bass player was like he started shake fork records it was like you know like it was like they were like a different they were a west suburb we were kind of like a north suburb and so we would like bring our friends to their shows they would yeah um i mean trench mouth we played a bunch probably with them uh eight bark i'm trying to think of uh there's a tetsuo would be like a metalish kind of band it was like friends of ours was uh, uh bobo stiffs had probably broken up by them but was gear going I don't know. I don't know them. Maybe, yeah. Maybe it's an underground Peg thing. But connection. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, uh, I'm a fan of Peg Boy. I don't know if I ever if we played with Peg. Maybe we played once with Peg Boy. Uh, is that did they went on to be Peg Boy? No, I think. Well, I think one of the guys from Peg Boy was in Bopal Stiffs, and then someone okay. from Bopal Stiffs was in Gear. Okay, and it sounds Gear, familiar. Gears, I think, on Octung Chicago one. I think that's how I know it. Yeah, yeah, just from the underdog connection. But I don't really. Yeah, I don't think we. It was a crossover show or playing shows, maybe. It's um, wild when you break down those comps that like first run of comps that you guys are on. It's like those things are awesome. Like Chicago, such they? a comp city. Oh my <laughs> god, dude! Okay, let's let's run them down real quick. No, we don't <laughs> even have to. Um, it, I think it's so cool. Again, it's like. A, I guess it was at the time, you know, it would be like, oh, like instead of uh, going and shooting more baskets at the park on a Saturday, we're going to go, uh, we're going to go into a studio and we're going to make this thing. And then we have to have, we're going to get them pressed and then we're going to have this merchandise and sell them at the show. Like it was like this whole, like, it was like uh, the coolest lemonade stand ever for like a high school kid, like to be able to like, yeah, like it was just so fun. Yeah. Yeah. With- were there other bands like our Ivy League and those bands? Um, we... Ivy League is a dude from uh, a couple guys from Gage was in Ivy League. And Dan they Panic went, was the drummer. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Danny Panic. Then he played in Screechy Wheel and he started Sludgeworth was another band that like yeah. I liked for a, a hot minute. Um, Love that band. Yeah. Fantastic. They were fun. Did a it's... couple catchy ones. Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm, it's everything we're naming. I'm like, oh, yeah, I totally like remember this band and play these bands i didn't i don't think we were like accepted by all these scenes at the time you know we kind of create our own scene with our own friends um because they were sort of established and they were more melodic or more i don't know yeah. well do you guys play with crudos would because i i could picture like fests with you guys on them we yeah a couple times we we i think we played we were the band playing at 1 p.m and they probably played at 8 p.m um I remember just in Wrigleyville, I remember like my mom having to drive me to play one of those fests or whatever. Um, but I like wasn't allowed. It was at a bar or something. I, I had to just like, they let me in just to play drums for our set and then I had to leave. So my mom drove me. Um, I guess Martine's the exception to that sort of uh, not like not great front people thing we were talking about earlier from oh, you know, no, humble front it. people. Like one of the greatest front people of all time. Yeah, they were. No, we were like fans. Um, I don't think we like cross paths a lot. I know like, you know, seeing him at Fireside and chill. Like it was, it, yeah, there were some bands that were just like, you know, we don't deserve to play with them. I don't know. Like we're just a bunch of kids and fun crushing it. Yeah. Um, yeah, Crudos is awesome. I'm trying to think like, I'm just also having the Fireside as this venue like it's you know every band it was just bringing whatever we were doing in chicago they were bringing that that same scene from every other city around the country through through chicago so i can witness it also um yeah it was it was so fun it was like collecting baseball cards but it was just seven inches in bands and yeah it also felt like as the 90s went on and into the 2000s kind of like the walls were going up between subgenres in a way like to the point mm-hmm. where Tim 
from Rise Against was on the show and says that he got made fun of by his friends when he joined a band with people from 88 Fingers Louie. Oh, that's like, funny. Right. Yeah. 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 Like whatever they, yeah. Cause it was like a completely different world by that point. Like there's that. Um, and I love, I love Bo Weevils. I love 88 Fingers Louie and I love that sound too. Like that's what I think is so great about the cities. There's just like mm-hmm. every band's fucking awesome. I think you're right. I think like early on, early 90s, we would have all been on the same bill for sure. I mean, I can picture the Captain Jazz Bo Weevils flyer in my head still, like whatever. Like, um, and then maybe just within a decade or some, I get, yeah, like maybe it's like Nirvana broke everything. And then I don't know. It's like, yeah, started getting classified and then major labels started classifying shit. And yeah, it happened that fast, I guess. Yeah. Like, was there, I guess you're so young, but like, was that perceptible to you? Like, there's all that talk about like Screeching Weasel maybe getting signed in the wake of Green Day. So I guess that would have been a few years later. I, uh, yeah. I mean, I remember when Green Day signed, it was like a, I took it as an insult and whatever. And yeah. I thought Dookie sounded terrible, even though it objectively sounds probably fantastic compared to like all the Kerplunk. And I was like a, a big fan of like the early shit. Um, uh, it's the same. I took my daughter to see Olivia Rodrigo last night and the way she's like, you know, she's 14 and like so into it and like a fan. I'm like, that's how I was with Green Day before they like signed. And, and then, uh, yeah, I re- I know, you know, like the Nirvana thing was a huge deal, actually. <laughs> I mean, I remember uh, seeing the video, it Smells Like Teen Spirit, for the first time. Freshman year of high school, there was a pizza place that we can walk to from school. And during lunch, you know, Nirvana, we're like, just like a tiny shitty TV in the corner. And we're just like, what the fuck was that? Like, was that just on TV? Like, what the fuck? Like, that was, and then, uh, you know, within four months, uh there'd be like these like local battle of bands or whatever. Every battle of bands, every band played Smells Like Teen Spirit. <laughs> so we knew something was happening. We were the only band playing like originals and like all these, they're all doing Smells Like Teen, they're all doing the same song. Um, yeah, it was crazy. So would you guys still do like little kid band stuff, like playing battle of the bands? Like, cause you had records on underdog by 89, right? Or 90, uh, 90, 92, not, I guess, maybe. 91. 90 or 91 or 2, I think, was sort of when we started. Um, 91, I guess. I mean, it was all little kid band shit. I mean, yeah, like, it was... Uh, I got brought out of... I got taken out of school in 8th grade to go play the variety show at Tim's High School. You know what I mean? Like, it was like, oh, you can miss the middle of this day and we're going to play this variety show and I thought it was a big deal. And we, a couple of our friends were like... They just wanted to be on stage, so we just they just we told them to just like mosh while we're playing. So we just played <laughs> the variety show, and they moshed, and you know, yeah, I thought it was a big deal because I was in eighth grade hanging out with high school kids. Uh, we played. Uh, uh, I, I just remember I don't even know who the girl is. Jenny Garcia's graduation party, like we just played her backyard. You know, like you know, they were like she was a senior punk or something, and we were little punks. I don't know. Uh, I mean, it was all that shit. That's all it was. That was, again, like, that was the only option, though. It was like, it wasn't, there was no, we didn't have, there was no, it wasn't like we didn't even have it because we couldn't find one. There was no, you didn't have, like, a manager or a booking agent. You, you know, Tim would just find numbers in maximum rock, rock, maximum rock and roll and just, like, call people or write people and be like, can we play? You know, I'm trying to set up this, like, two-week tour out you know, and we made our way all the way up to, uh, you know, like South Dakota's as far west as we got. Just like, you know, there's no, <laughs> we didn't have any maps. You just like pull over. Okay, we're at this like gas station. You told us we'd find, what do we do now? How do we get to your house? Okay, cool. Yeah, it was so fun. That wouldn't, I mean, I wish I could like take my kids' cell phones away and like be like, <laughs> go on tour for a month and figure it out. You'll have the, you know what I mean? You're going to, you're going to hate it, but you're going to love it. That's the best, yeah. I think subjecting any kid to life in a van without a cell phone now, that would be hell for me as a yeah. 40 as a pa- Yeah, I know. I couldn't, I know I'm addicted to, but I, I, was it ever like you were leading this double life? Cause you're still like in high school as you're in this band that obviously it's not like you're saying, like, it's not like on mainstream radio at the same time, but like you're doing real shit at the same time that like, it wasn't know, it was real. I'm saying it, it was really, it was real fun. It wasn't, there wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, it was, it was like the coolest uh, hobby, you know what I mean? Like it was, 
you know, if so, if Tim's a junior and I'm a freshman in high school and we know, I don't know, maybe, yeah, I mean, he started driving, whatever. She, my parents are so cool. They got us like this tiny old shitty used van. And so we spent the summer, you know, like gutting it, building a loft and putting, I mean, it was so fun. You know, it's the first time I got to use like tools, like any, <laughs> anything I've taught, it's because we started the stupid van. So it was so fun. Um, I, I remember like, you know, we'd have like a show in Wisconsin on a Sunday night and then we'd drive home after the show and I'd go to school Monday and I'd, I'd be wearing whatever cool, like compound red shirt or whatever band, you know, from Wisconsin. I thought it was so cool that nobody else in the school had this shirt, but me, you know, like, yeah, it was fun. Well, that's the other great thing about punk is it is kind of like the, uh, I know this is loaded. So every time I say this, I, I, I feel like maybe I should find another way of explaining it, but it's almost like the real red pill. Like, where oh, yeah. you, you know, like you're, you all of a sudden, all the high school shit is inverted. So the coolest mm -hmm. people are now the biggest dorks and you don't want to hang out and go to their events. You don't want any part of it. They, you don't, they don't understand where you're living now at all. Mm -hmm. and, right. and it, it, it saved me in a lot of ways. It certainly yeah. saved my mental health. Yeah. And then once like you see that though, like you're just like, you're a bulletproof then. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. That's what, yeah, exactly. Like once you find, I think it's sort of like find your people and you find confidence in anything. I mean, like, uh, you know, that's what I'm so indebted to. Uh, I'm thinking back like this guy, Mark Pearsall, who wasn't really in bands, but he was like, he put out the first Cabin Jazz record. You know what I mean? Like he's just some kid that figured out how to save enough money to press a thousand records or whatever, you know, 500. I don't know what the first press was. Um, and I don't think it was like he didn't have aspirations of getting rich and famous doing it. He just thought it was so fucking cool. You know what I mean? Like, and then he did that and it, enabled all of us to continue doing this it's like this whole path that once it started yeah like it's just led me here which it, is awesome it's weird because now there's everything's got social capital and everything's mm -hmm. part of your personal marketing uh mm -hmm. social media campaign i mean like as individuals not even just people in bands oh I, yeah i mean like a 14 my daughter yeah i mean like everybody yeah, right everyone yeah, right. everyone right so yeah. like it's weird to think about people doing the thing just to do the thing when there wasn't necessarily yeah. fame involved like like these sort of like and and I guess putting out records, you know, you could become like Gerard Cosloy and become like a famous for putting out records. But like for the yeah. most part, it's kind of a thankless job or like putting on a show. Like there was no social capital in putting on a show. Yeah. I then. mean, at the time you got to see the band that you want. That's why exactly, I'm telling yeah. you, like, you know, like we would, our, our buddies would bring lungfish because we're like, well, we want to see them. <laughs> yeah. Let's offer them the how much money. Okay. How many friends do we have to have to show up? Cool. Everybody's going to pay five bucks. Okay. We got enough money. We told them how much we had. And they're like, yeah. And then Dan Higgs shows up and is a total fucking weirdo. And we all got exactly what we wanted. Like, like, we got to witness his weirdness. His, his son was the guitar player in the band Trapped Under Ice, which is the pre turnstile band. So you can connect Lungfish to Oh, really? Yeah. In like two moves. But he's not in turnstile. He didn't go on to turnstile, but he, no trapped under ice that's so was, funny that his son daniel Higgs son yeah crazy yeah he did the art for their first seven inch that's awesome yeah yeah it's it's like i don't know i find that also interesting like i'm my kids have very little interest in punk outside of nirvana mm -hmm. these days but um and that's only my youngest that's in nirvana but like i i would love the idea of this being some sort of culture that i can pass on to them and then these mm -hmm. records don't become garbage they become something that's actually yeah charged. like total fucking chairs yeah I mean, me too. Like the kids have no interest in it's just, yeah. Uh, I guess I don't know. Like, uh, you know, I said I wish they would go on a tour or something. I wish they would just like find something as a what's the word I'm looking for? Like, um, I guess I don't know. Tim probably told the story. Like, my mom baked Fugazi a cake and delivered it to him <laughs> backstage. It was in, in like they played in Chicago and. I was a freshman in college and I came up from school to go to the show and she just like made him a cake and like, you know, like security kind of like walked her back. And I just remember she was like, I just want I made this cake. Thanks so much for being such a great influence on my kids. Like she appreciated in the same way that I'm saying about like my kids, like find something that's like, you know, like uh, valuable. Like, yeah, like the influence they had is just like, I mean, obviously musically, but also just as like the ethos of it and stuff is like it didn't help us make any money, but, it, but it like, it totally instilled like really cool ethics in us. So. Yeah. Like what I had a friend 
who definitely was not straight edge very long, but you used to always say like, even if it is just a trend or just a phase, like what a great phase for a young mm. person to have where they yeah. can, you know, and, and I feel like the values um, that these people instilled granted when you're trying to make a living in it do become kind of a burden in a lot of ways, but, but they do set you on a path that is, you know, like there, why can't we set up our own economies? Why can't we mm-hmm. exist independently from these things? And or it, like, know, even i mean like why i can still i can sleep pretty good on floors still i just have these skills <laughs> that like i don't think most people either want to have or should have but i'm like i can probably sleep on a floor no problem you know what i mean i can fall yeah. asleep under a kitchen table during I a party because i've done it before exactly yeah, yeah i've had to do it so it was yeah. great with kids because well it was terrible for my poor partner lauren but um for me because i could sleep through like babies crying like oh yeah. my god <laughs> yeah. I've, I've dealt with adults crying that i've slept I've, through. yeah all the bandmates exactly they yeah. all cried yeah this is long... yeah exactly uh this has been amazing and mm-hmm. i gotta say mike if you ever want to come back on this thing and talk about any of this stuff ah, i would okay. love to have you back on okay cool yeah thanks for asking me fun